Hello, hello, all my beautiful and leading ladies. I'm Antoinette Westcott here with my co-host, Renee L. Page. Hello, 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 beautiful leading ladies. <laughs> this week, we have Sonia Balcazar joining us. Sonia Balcazar is a proud Chicana from East San Jose. She's a professional actress who moved to L.A. at the beginning of the pandemic. Since being here, she has networked her way to several jobs, such as a new Chicano sitcom, The King of Downey, and a short film in broad daylight. She also moonlights as a leadership position in a client mm. services department. But Sonia is one of those rare people that really loves her job. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Sonia. Rare. <laughs> It, 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 thank you. Thank you for, for having me. And uh, thank you for that introduction. It's, Welcome. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you say one of those rare people that loves their job. Um, it is rare. It yeah. is rare to actually say I love waking up in the morning and going to work. Like I work remotely, but I really love what I do. <laughs> and I'm just blessed that I just aligned with the right company that has the same values that I hold and, um, and it works. So, yeah. So you don't work, start your own company to do it. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. So when you love what you do, it's not work, right? Exactly. I don't, I I truly love what I do. And that's why I don't dread waking up in the morning and doing what I love because I I love doing it. It doesn't feel like work. But let me ask what is it? Yeah, go ahead. So you don't dread it, but what, keeps you from hitting the snooze button when you get up Um, your alarm clock goes off what keeps you from hitting that snooze button the love of the job (laughs) Renee well I mean um a lot of things I guess okay (laughs) there's a lot of things um you know to be honest there's a lot of things I'm motivated by in life um, one thing I would recommend, and um, I think I read this book maybe a couple years ago. It might have been pre-COVID. Um, okay. The five second rule. Um, and um, I don't know if you. you when you read drop it. something, food on the ground in five seconds. To no, no. Five, yeah. <laughs> no. It's, it's a book, it's, right? It's a book about yeah. um, giving yourself that five seconds to like, okay. You're like three, two, one, like, uh, well, I'm sorry. Is it five second roll? Three second roll. I forgot. It's something. Yeah. But it's about a woman, right? Um, it's a woman. It's just about making this, this, the decision to, to do what you need to do in the face of fear or in the face of doubt or in the face of, um, some type of negotiation. Like, should I do something? Which is, you just count off and you just go, you know, yeah. you're like, oh, I'm going to get up, just get out of bed, just go. Um, it's just one of those things where you just kind of count off and it's like a rocket thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And you just stop doubting yourself and, and get going because the it's just your mind, right? It's just your mind and your thoughts that are keeping you back from the things that you want to do. And you just got to kind of push through it. I mean, but which honest, part of your mind do you listen to? The one that says no, hit the snooze button or get your ass out of bed? Well, I mean... I'm human. So there's days where I actually don't want to get out of bed because I'm physically tired because I didn't get enough rest. And then I know, okay, tomorrow I need to go to bed earlier, get enough sleep Mm -hmm. because I'm going to feel this way. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's still days like that. Even if, even if you want to hit snooze, you're still going to want to hit snooze. (laughs) But you don't find that you're like justifying it in your brain. Like, okay, if I got five more minutes and if then, well, tomorrow I have to get up. So today I can sleep in. (laughs) Well, you know, uh, I do give myself grace, like on the weekends, um, last weekend I slept, I went to bed Friday night and I slept 12 hours, woke up on Saturday, but I know that I need to balance my life and my rest and recovery. So I might go hard Monday through Friday, but I know my body at, by the time Saturday comes around, if I don't give myself that grace and that rest. Yep. then um, I'm not going to be productive. So I need to give that recovery time. So I slept 12 hours and I, I, I can, I need it. <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm I love my not sleep. By the end of the week, but uh, I, I run on all cylinders. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, so if I can start with some of the rapid fire, um, what's one of your best investments you purchased in 2021 under a hundred dollars? In 2021, last year. 
under a hundred dollars. Um, and not Clorox wipes or hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> 2021, but that was last last year. Oh, uh, Apple watch. Um, an Apple watch to track my, um, my, uh, activity and the rings. Right. I bought one of those because I was working out, but I really didn't know how many, like what my heart rate was or my calories or, um, you know, just getting motivated by other friends who are actually on the app. And how long have you had it now? Um, well, I got it in 2021 and I have, uh, two friends that we kind of motivate each other. And when I'm not as active, my friend's like, what, are you okay? Are you sick? What's going on? How come you're not doing any workouts? It's kind of like accountability, right? Yeah. So I was going to say your accountability partners. Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to, I know my tendencies, like my psychological tendencies. And I know for me, accountability is something that um, it helps when I have other people that provide some words of affirmation or other people that are recognizing some of the work that I do. And so the Apple watch was something that it just, it just like the psychology of, um, having other people watch what you're doing and hold you accountable to. It's like, oh, well, I don't, I don't want to slack off because my friend can see that. So <laughs> have you used it for I'm Tinder? Get to, get a workout <laughs> Not that you're on Tinder, but I remember the first Apple watch, like it with Tinder, it would swipe right and left for you based on your heartbeat. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like it got used to your pattern. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's pretty, that's interesting. Pretty innovative. Yeah. To get. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been looking into an Apple watch. So. And it's compatible yeah. with your iPhone, right? Correct. <laughs> Renee has an Android. Ah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Apple girl. So, you know. Uh, y'all yeah. taking bull crap each other. <laughs> <laughs> we can I message each other directly. <laughs> I, think, I think it's great to motivate each other. You know, you motivate your friends and see how you're doing and just kind of stay up to date and, and just, I don't know. I think it's fun. <laughs> it yeah. Fun. Yeah. I've fun. been looking into it for sure. Yes. What's your favorite book? The Alchemist. Mm. Yeah. What is that about? Um, it's a, it's a fictional story um, about this, um, young boy who's kind of going through this journey of trying to find what his path is and, um, what his treasure is, is really how it's, how it's written. Um, it's just a wonderful tale of finding your passion and finding what's important to you as an individual. Um, and understanding that, your treasure or your gold or your life's purpose or whatever it is, is not in some type of final destination or, or treasure box. It's really in the journey Mm -hmm. and it's the journey that counts. And it's the journey and the values that you um, carry with you and the trials and tribulations and the lessons you learn along the way. That's really what life is about. Not about some treasure box at the end or some type of, um, arbitrary thing that you want to achieve. It's really the journey and figuring out who you are in that journey, journey, making mistakes and learning from them. Um, it's an amazing book. I, I know it's, it's a lot of, it's on, it's the top, it's the favorite book of a lot of people. Um, but I've read it, reread it. I've gifted it to friends. Oh my um, goodness. Okay. I always have and a you've got good feedback it from it. I bet. <laughs> That, that, that's one of my favorites. And then, I mean, you asked me for my favorite, but I also like, Oh, there's more. um, Yeah. I like letters to a poet. That's another one that I gift out to friends. And, um, I just, I I think that's an amazing, that's an, that's that's one for artists though. Okay. Artist. Um, that would, I don't know any of these, so I have, I'm going to have a lot of reading to do over the next (laughs) year. (laughs) We're getting a lot of good recommendations. So, and Renee loves our book club. So she's got me reading too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm also a big fan of audiobooks too. Oh yes. Um, But I'll, I'll just do that more. So if like I'm in a long drive and I'm sitting in traffic. Yes. I love it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what's one of your 
number one pieces of advice for self-care? <sighs> um, rest. Yeah. Grant yourself rest because, okay. I, and, and I'm guilty of this and I've evolved as a person too. And um, through understanding that uh, burning out is not, is not, it's not admirable to anyone. Yeah. I mean, working hard. Um, I come from a family that, you know, my parents have a very strong work ethic. My dad would, um, he would, he would go to work. My, my mom and dad would go to work sick and they wouldn't call out sick. They would be sent home sick because right. they, they would still go to work. Oh, that was me all and, the time. Yes. And then and you so get everybody that, else sick. Yes. And so it was one of those things where you, they take pride in kind of working through illness and take pride in working hard and take pride in like the work that they're assigned to do. Um, and so I, I learned that from watching them, but as I evolved, um, as a human being and the things that I learned, it's, it's just, it's not admirable to be, I mean, even at the company I work at now, which I, you know, evolved as a person, I used to be in the office until 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I'd be the first one in the and office and I'd be the last one. Last in the lead. Yeah. And I thought that that was just that I thought that was a good thing because I was working so hard and I was so passionate about what I was doing. But the truth is that's not it's quality of life. Yeah. yeah. I mean, why would I waste my years away doing that? If or somebody else. Yes. <laughs> and not only that, I was passionate about what I was doing and I saw value in it. It's just I needed to grant myself the rest that was needed so I can be a more productive person. So I'm better when I'm rested. I can think more critically, solve problems when I'm rested. And so grant yourself that. I would give someone advice to like, give yourself the grace, give yourself rest, say no. If you made a commitment and you you need, you know, you need rest, be, be okay with disappointing people to yeah. give yourself the grace that you need to rest and recover. Yes. Yeah, to recover, rest and recover. Yeah. Yep. So if you could have coffee with one person, who would it be? Ooh, uh, coffee with one person. Oh, probably um, <laughs> it's one person. <laughs> so many people. Uh, probably my grandfather on oh, my dad's side. How beautiful. Um. We were Did really you? close and he passed away when I was five, but we were really close. And I have, I, I, this is weird to say, but I remember what he smells like. Like, I just remember mm. just being in his arms and I would love to have coffee with my grandfather. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He passed away when I was five. So, you know, wow. Those are the you best remember memories. that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember What's your favorite podcast. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> what was that? No, go. What were you, what you were going to tell us a story uh, about your grandfather? Funeral. I remember his funeral. Like, I don't know. I was five, but I remember it. I remember it clearly. I remember watching my aunt walk up to the casket. I remember watching my aunt cry. I remember where my dad was at. I don't, it's just such a vivid memory. And I was just so close to my grandfather, you know, um, it just, yeah, I just, I would love to, I would love to have coffee with him if he was alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, I can relate. <laughs> What's your favorite podcast? Um, I have, I have quite a few. I do. Um, I'm a big fan of Mind Valley, and um, I do. I, I've watched so many Mind Valley podcasts. I feel like they procure excellent, um, speakers to, to interview. And, um, I learned so much and it's such a wide range of, um, speakers and, and ideologies. I just feel like I, I just take away bits and pieces of what I listen to, um, on Mind Valley, And, um, I, it, it helps make me a better person. So um, I'm always enlightened when I, when I listen to Mind Valley. Right Mind there. Valley? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. 
That sounds really good and something that I want to listen to. <laughs> and Renee is taking notes. So, yeah. Nice. yeah. <laughs> if you could switch careers tomorrow, what would you try? No, that's going to be a hard question for you. <laughs> Which careers? Like something that I'm not currently doing? Because I have two careers. I have my right. leadership career and I have my acting career. Right. If I could switch careers tomorrow, what would I do? <sighs> um, I have this deep passion to help foster children. And I would want to um, probably develop some type of um, nonprofit or some type of way that I can help a lot of foster children. <laughs> I just, I want to be a foster mom one day and, um, I will, I will be a foster mom one day. And I just want to be able to access more students. I want to be able to access more children and help them where, where I currently work now. Um, we do educate students in technology. Um, but it's not, a, it's a business and it's, for profit. So I want to be able to access the students that don't have the opportunity to get access to the education that's out there. Um, but I would love to help foster children in the arts, in um, technology and education, in, you know, love, life, nurturing, everything and anything, like just to help be the parents that they don't have or the some, most of them have parents, but be the support systems that they don't have. I would probably do something in the, the nonprofit sector. We should start like a school, like, uh, like, <laughs> you know, you can go away to different summer camps or something for foster kids. Instead of trying to find homes for kids, like make it uh, like an academy. So they get room and board, they get to do the intramurals and the sports and education, you know, and all, and it just, we, all the money gets donated <laughs> when yeah. they turn 16, they can have a car too. <laughs> yeah. And then there's also a lot of partnerships with, um, I know the company I work for, um, we have a strategic alliances team that partners with um, companies that will sponsor kids to attend camps that have specific access to things like a summer camp or like a, a you know a themed camp so they can get access to different things it's about being the advocate advocate to, to get the money to get the funds to sponsor them to go but yeah there's so many opportunities out there you just need someone to focus on it and have the time and energy to do that and that would be amazing if I could if yeah. I could spend time and change my career I'd focus on that do you have children of your own or you just really are focused on fostering? I, I don't. I don't. I specific, I have, I have a strong mindset on this and this is something I developed early on. Um, when I was younger, I helped raise my siblings. And so when I was 12, actually when I was six, I took on kind of like that big sister motherly role with my brother. And then when my sister was born, when I was 12, um, I took on that motherly role as well. My parents worked a lot. And so um, I have a lot of empathy and compassion for children and taking care of my siblings and what, helping raise them. I, I know it's becoming a parent and having a child is the single most important role you can ever play in any, in your entire life. And I feel like I can benefit, I can give more value to um, people that don't have those parents or don't have that support or are, you know, um, um, orphans, like I can be of better service as opposed to by giving them support in other ways, as opposed to having my own children. Like I don't have that need to, you know, have my own children and, and have that be my legacy. My legacy is in a different way, which is providing kind of like a wider spread, um, you know, support system or love and care and nurturing or um, help, I feel like, um, to people in, in the things that I do. And I do that now, I feel like, um, with acting, but also in my day job, um, we do focus on children 7 to 19, educating them. And so I, I feel like I do that all the time. Mm -hmm. I just don't, I don't have that need to do it, like, to have my own children to do that. Children to do it. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, what what is the piece of advice that was shared with you that you wish you would have listened to? 
<laughs> don't work so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, and this is something I had to, I had to learn, even though I was told this many, many times. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I was told by many people that I work too hard. Me too. And my response was always, but like, but I'm passionate, but I love what I do. And, you know, um, I just, when I just get passionate about something, I'm like tunnel vision. I'm like focused. If I have a mission or I'm on, like I have this, this path that I'm on, like I'm relentless. And so, um, I've had relationships where my partners have told me like, you need to chill. Like yeah. you work, you work a lot, you work hard and, and nothing's going to stop me if I, if I have, you know, a purpose or mindset, okay. my family knows this as well. Um, but the truth is they were right. I do work too. I did work too hard and it took me some healing and some own self-reflection to go through and understand that I have to balance that work and those goals and that mission with rest and recovery, meditation, health, um, you know, healing. And you know, I talk a lot about resting and recovery now because sleep is important to me now. It wasn't mm-hmm. important to me before. I could probably operate on four hours of sleep and still go to work and still oh do my goodness, all these yeah. things. Now I need to get eight hours sleep. I need to, to be my best self. And so do you find that's because you're getting older? <laughs> yeah. No, I like we're not like, in our teens anymore. So, we're, that, you know, you know, that biologically that obviously has something to do with it. But I also know that I'm I can think clearer and I'm better. I, I'm more valuable on eight hours sleep than I am on six or anything else. Like I can make better decisions and I can make um, critical decisions um, you know, valuable decisions went on better sleep. If I didn't have that sleep, I'd probably make more mistakes or, um, just not be clear of mind to make the best decisions. And so I know I see the value in the rest and the recovery now I do. And I didn't see that before. So, um, that's something that I've evolved through. And I feel like don't work so hard. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm like but I, you know, work hard, play hard. I feel like I also play hard too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you um, mentioned that you were like a mother figure early on and uh-huh. when you were still a child, do you think that that's why you've gravitated towards the film industry and acting to be able to be a child again and have your play time? Yeah. Well, uh, that's a, that's a great point. I'm sure that has, um, some to do with it. It's like some of the reason why, um, I feel like, um, my tendency is, is to nurture and to care for others. But I also, um, in, in the role that I played as a child, that has a lot to do with how I am as an adult and my personality and the tendencies that I have. Right. So that shaped me, but I also have to understand that, um, that's where that comes from. Right. So who I am and how I grew up to be comes from how I was raised as a child. And so I get that. And so, um, I know that when I was younger, those things are what I cared about. I cared about my siblings that I cared about their health and safety. Um, even when I went, went away to college, I would check in on them like a mother would even though I was away at college. And so I still had that nurturing feeling towards them, but I always knew that I wanted my own independence as well. I always knew that, you know, even when I was 12, um, I am taking care of my, my siblings. Um, I wrote poetry. I was already, you know, acting. I did speech contests. I was already in the arts. I was dancing and I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that's like personally my independence and how I wanted to share my art and share and express myself. So I knew that was something I always wanted. I just needed the opportunity to do it. And so, um, knowing that I loved and cared for taking care of people, but also wanting to share my gifts with the world, my talents, expressing myself through arts. 
that was my outlet, right? That was a way for me to um, kind of give back to the world. When did you realize that you wanted to be an actress? Um, well, I've always, I've kind of wanted to act, but it's different from realize I wanted to be an actress. <laughs> you okay. know? Because I, you know, same thing with dancing. I'm a dancer as well. I mean, I'll dance regardless, but it doesn't mean I want to be a dancer, right? So, um, Flamenco, what kind of dancing? Uh, Latin dance. So, um, salsa, bachata. Oh, oh. Um, oh yeah. Latin you went to a, a concert the other day. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Los Angeles Bachata Festival was um, mm-hmm. a couple of weeks, of, well, it was in February. Um, I performed on a dance team um, years back at that festival um, and other, several other festivals. I used to be a, a performer as well in dance. Um, but yeah, so I think, it's always been in your blood. <laughs> yes. Yes. I've always been a dancer since I was a kid. I was oh. in dance groups as a kid and, you know, um, it was just something I loved to do. Uh, you couldn't, I, I, since I was a child, yeah, you couldn't, I was dancing in the living room, dancing in the room. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like we all were. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Not me. Uh, I didn't know what dancing was. <laughs> <laughs> But I, when I realized I wanted to be an, an actor, it was probably um, in high school, maybe junior high, high school. I wanted to major in acting for college in, some, some, in, a, in the arts. And I remember the college application came around and, you know, I'm trying to decide on a major and I'm like going over it with my parents, my dad, I'm like, yeah, I want to apply to this school. And they have this really good art program, this really good theater program. And he was just like, absolutely not. Mm. I'm not have my daughter become a starving artist. No, you have to do something practical with your life, you know? And obviously he's comes from a, a hard working work at good work ethic. Um, you know, those, those are his values. And so when I told him I wanted to be an actor, he's like, no, yeah, no, <laughs> no we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to do that. And so, you know, he, he, I mean, he was right. He was, He's like, do something practical with your education. And then you can always do your art. You can always act. You can always dance. Like after you get your ed- education, you know, you could just, but get your foundation d- down first, which was a great, great advice for my dad. When I was a kid, I, I was like, ah, but you know, obviously <laughs> years later, I'm like, oh, thank God my dad did that because it allowed me to get educated and get really good. And what I do now, which supports me. And then, yes, I can, I can act, I act all the time now. And I feel like, well, my parents did that that. to me as well. And I wish they hadn't, like, I wish I came moved to LA when I was 20, you know, 18, right out of college, uh, high school Mm -hmm. when I wanted to, like, I'd be a lot further along and, you know, but I wouldn't have had these life experiences that help my acting now. (laughs) You know, I don't have these tools in my toolbox, you know, that I have now that I didn't have back then. But I still wish that I, you know, what did college do for me? I don't know what college did for me. I, you know, was a manager at a law firm that didn't do anything for my education, having a bachelor's degree, you know, that wasn't what I wanted to do. What did you major in for your bachelor's? Marketing and business management. You don't use it. You don't think you use that for your acting career? I feel like I use everything that I learned in business school for my acting career. I use it all. Marketing, branding, uh, organization, networking, relationships. I use everything that I learned in college for my acting career. Um, But I I learned how to connect the dots, you know? Um, I feel like I have some actor friends of mine who are like, how, how are you so organized with all your acting mm-hmm. stuff, like your profiles and your photos and this and your resumes and your um, footage? Like, I'm just like, I learned that in college. Yeah. Um, it, because so then you think it, there's an advantage of college then to the versus the actors that didn't go to college? I think well, like I they're like, finding it harder to have a business, like, because you're the business. Yeah. I, I'm running right. my business. I'm right. I'm my acting right. is a business in itself. Because I have to promote myself. I have to market myself. I have to stay, keep things organized in my acting career, right? The work and, you know, all the profiles and the websites. It's just, 
it, it's business. You're running a business. And if you don't know how to do those things, you have to learn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. and, or, or you can just be really talented. And I have a lot of talented, talented, talented friends who know nothing about the acting side of business, the business side of acting. And they would be much further along if they owned that, if they took control of like the what? Business. Can you give us an example? Um, <laughs> keeping something as simple as keeping your acting profiles up to date, uh, updating your IMDb's, connecting yeah. with the producers you worked with and the directors, and having them add you. Um, you know, putting your credited work together. Um, just, you know, there's a lot, a lot of what I do is relationship building. So when I work with directors, producers, or even other actors, it's about planting the seeds with that, that person in a relationship, a business relationship is okay. acting. And I plant those seeds months or years before I even actually work with those producers or work with those directors, because, uh, you know, it takes time to learn what their work is about, um, watch it you know, um, understand that someone you want to work with and then nurture that relationship, share your work with them so that when something does pop up that you match, then you're the first person they're going to call. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of business involved. Um, just being organized overall. Like, I feel like I, I have an alarm set at five o'clock, which at 5 PM. And that's when I finish my day job. Literally when that alarm goes off, like I flip the switch and I flip that um switch to the acting part of me mm -hmm. and I just switched to business side of acting and now do all my acting stuff check emails follow up with people um do a self-tape audition study some work study some characters um you know watch something watch the work of another actor that I admire and I want to get better at read scripts um you know read acting books it's just it's constant development how constant. much time do you set aside for that I, I feel like I work two full-time jobs. I work my eight hours in the day and then um, mm -hmm. sometimes that goes over. Um, but I, then I work another eight hours at night uh, until I go to bed <laughs> working <laughs> on my acting stuff. And sometimes I stay up late. Like last night I had a self tape that I had to do. So I stayed up a lot later than I would have wanted to, but um, you know, you just got to get the self tape. I had to do the work. <laughs> yeah. To get it done. <laughs> To yeah, be good, I, enjoy, have to I don't even feel it because I enjoy it so much. Like, it's not like, oh, I got to do this self tape or oh, I got to do this work. Like, no, I'm freaking excited. Yeah, <laughs> like, I want to fire do about it. <laughs> well, yeah. if I can get a little squeeze into your brain some more, you were telling Joel, our associate producer yeah. in the tech call, about you know, one of these things that you did use from college and you incorporated into your Instagram and how to get mm -hmm. to those directors and producers during the pandemic when everything was slow and not anything happening. What we don't, um, you mean my, about how, how you grew and you got a job act. out of Instagramming. Instagram. Oh, yes. Yeah. When I moved, I just moved to Los Angeles, August 2020. During COVID, everything was shut down. And I keep I'm like, you couldn't even get a haircut. You couldn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. And, couldn't get your hair done. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I'm going to use this time wisely. Nobody was really shooting anything at that time. It was just it was still shut down. And so I would get off work. I work remotely. So I would just, you know, finish work during the day. And then um, I would set my alarm and I would, I would look at hashtags on Instagram of filmmakers and producers in Los Angeles on uh, social media, especially Instagram. And then I would follow a lot of the, um, I would find filmmakers and then I would watch their work. And if there was a filmmaker that I really liked um, the work that they did, then I would watch more of their work. I'd go on their IMDb's, I'd comment on it. I would follow, um, any new things that they were working on and just develop that relationship. I would DM them and I would just like, Hey, I mean, what do I got to lose? Either they read my message or they don't, or they don't answer me. Like I'm just going to DM them anyway. And, you know, I'd love to work with you one day. And I just started doing that and just networking with people. But I mean, I wasn't just throwing, you know, DMS anywhere. I like, I actually worked. I actually looked at their work. I actually appreciated, I could name what they worked on. 
And right. so you took the time to invest in their career to see why you liked their wanted, work and you right. had something tangible to comment on. Exactly. And so that's how I started planting those seeds. And then eventually um, I started getting requests for uh, self tapes or referrals from those filmmakers. And I never even met them in person because it was COVID. So um, through, were, through um, actors access or no, privately Instagram. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sweet. Scripts through Instagram and filmmakers. Like, yeah, it was just like, Oh, wow. People are still working. <laughs> I just <laughs> get stuff done. And so, um, that's, and I ended up getting, um, I ended up getting cast in this, um, in broad daylight, the film, uh, that I ended up working on with, um, four ways entertainment, but I had got cast. I had connected with them the year prior on 2020. And then I worked with them in 2021. So it took like a, almost a wow. year of to connect. Right. And to, and to actually work with them. And now I've, I'm, you know, the film is going to be at the San Diego Latino Film Festival next Saturday, March 19th. Um, our film oh. will be there as well. Oh, so, cool. you know, I mean, but I feel like just that time of spending the time to invest in researching filmmakers you want to work with and connecting and networking, I think is so important because um, you can't be idle in your, in your career. Like you can't just sit there and allow your agent to send you, submit you, like you got to take control of your career and do something about it and network and get people to know who you are. Like, I'm, I'm not about to just sit here and let someone else, you know, kind of control my business. Like I'm going to take control by getting my work out there. I, I send, I send pieces of work to random people that have never met me before and are probably really, really big. And they may see my DM or they may not, but I'm still sending it because I feel like, you know, um, I'm going to take the chance. I'm going to take the risk. And it's worked out for me because some, some people are like, Oh my God, they like responded. (laughs) Oh my God. God." And they're like, well, I don't have anything for you, but I have a friend who does. Let me refer you to my friend. I'm like, Thank you. Thank you. It's oh, always wow. the referral. Yeah. Yeah. It's inspiring to do that. But I, I've been doing this for years, I feel like, because I started in San Francisco in the Bay Area. And that's really, I'm doing the same thing I did in the Bay Area that I'm doing here. I just had to develop a whole new network because people in LA didn't know who I was. I, I'm from the Bay Area. I'm from San Jose. And all the acting work I did was in San Francisco. So moving out here in 2020, it's only 2022. Um, I had to work extra hard to kind of develop a whole new network out here in LA because nobody knew who I was Mm -hmm. (laughs) and nobody's going to know who I am unless I do the work. So it's my job to do that. Did you find that um, there were certain, like you've gotten typecast that you've gotten just certain roles or what is the range that you you've done for your work? You know, I know that there is a lot of typecasting. There is a lot of, um, you know, stereotypical roles. I don't think, I don't think I've experienced a lot of that only because I started my acting career in the Bay Area. And for some reason, there's a lot of ethnically ambiguous roles that I fit. And so, um, I mean, I guess the only thing I could say I've been typecast as is like the sexy, you know, <laughs> girl or sexy woman. Girlfriend, um, wife. Yeah. But other than that, like, um, I still feel like I've had an opportunity when I've been in casting rooms pre-COVID in casting director's offices in San Francisco. Like if you were to look a- around the room, like. I was in those rooms of, of all the other women that don't even look like me that had blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, I was still in the room. So I don't feel like I, um, was typecast in any way. I, because I was allowed to, uh, or maybe my agent was just really good at submitting me for roles, um, and not allowing me to get into that typecast. Um, So I had a lot of opportunity there. And so because I started there and then I moved here, I'm sure maybe if I started in LA, it might be different, Mm -hmm. but, um, but I do feel like I have a good range. 
there was there's something funny though. There was one year where someone pointed it out. It was someone, I think it was like a filmmaker who pointed it out. He goes, Do you realize that every film that you've been cast in this year, your every your partner dies, you either kill him or he or he gets killed, or he he dies in an accident, or he like. And I was like, oh, my God, every every male character that wow. opposite me that one year oh they all died. <laughs> <laughs> Their characters died. And then I'm like, oh, my God, that's so weird. Like, and he's like, yeah, you're just, yeah, the femme fatale. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was your most expiring role that you had? What was the most expiring, expiring role that you had? Oh, this one role where. Um, this is what changed my life with acting. And I felt like it was the ultimate confirmation that I chose the passion that is, that the creator gave me. And I was playing this uh, visceral role and I gravitate towards visceral roles. Like if I had a choice, I'd probably play all the dramatic visceral ones. Um, but it was a role of a woman who was um, at rock bottom. She was an alcoholic mm. and she was at rock bottom. And um, it's, it's a, a play that was, a, it was, I think it was a film that was adapted into a play, which is the opposite of the norm. Um, it's called mm. Days of Wine and Roses. And I think Jack Lemon, it was a black and white film. I think Jack Lemon played um, the male lead in that one. Um, but I did it on stage in San Francisco. And um, I'm an alcoholic in, in the, the character and I'm at rock bottom and my husband's trying to, he, he got clean and he's trying to get me to come around as well. Um, and so after that show, there was a woman who came up to me and she was like, she like grabbed me and she was like, thank you. Thank you for telling my story. She's like, I've never seen my story told before. And that was me 10 years ago, or I think 10 wow. or 11 years ago, that was me rock bottom. And I'm sober now, but I've never heard my story told and I've never seen my story told. And you just told it tonight. Wow. So thank you. And so I was like, oh my God, like, wow, this is, this is my purpose. My purpose is to tell the stories of the human condition through my art of acting and so moments like this where this woman who was sober now for a decade, she just needed to see that she was real and human and her experience was real. And you don't really see that. And so she needed to recognize that, that, that you know, her story is being told. So she thanked me in my art and what I did. And I thought, absolute confirmation, this is what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. But that was inspiring to me. Yeah. And it, not the character itself, but she was going through a trial, right? But the fact that I could speak to someone and touch someone in some way that made them feel seen. That's huge. And that was important to me. That's huge. Well, is there a story that you feel like you need to tell or a Chicana yeah. story that exactly. hasn't been told yet that mm -hmm. you need to get the word out? Uh, anything. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, yes, to answer your question, yes, there's a lot of stories to tell. I feel like I'm, I'm um, at the brink of that now. I'm writing a three episode short form anthology series um, that I feel is going to be on the creative side of things, but I also have a passion project that I'm working on. And the passion project is really about, um, you know, I feel like women um that i've recognized even in my own family and you know uh, relationships relationships that i've experienced that i've seen experienced by my friends you know aunts like just different women in my life their relationships and the trials and the tribulations that they go through um and i want to be able to tell the story of these from the perspective of these women and so it's a passion project of mine to get that story told. And um, I'm, I started the process this past year um, in, in 2021, and we're still in the process of writing it. 
So I'd like it to become a short film. Um, ultimately, I would love for it to become a feature, but I want to start with the short film, get it into some film festivals and then um, take it from there. But I feel very strong. Uh, like I feel this strong tug at me to tell that story. And it's like the story of our mothers and sisters and aunts and women in my life. So yes, I'm going to be telling a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, who are your role models that you grew up with? <sighs> my parents. That's where I said it. Yeah. My That's parents. your foundation. Sounds like the, yeah. your parents are your foundation. Yeah. Yes. My parents are just, um, you know, what, what I love that about my parents, like they've taught me so many things about life, but also, you know, they're not perfect. They're, they're human beings going through life, learning and growing and making mistakes, even as parents and, and learning from them. And, but through everything that we've been through as a family, they've always stuck to love, family values, um, you know, the tribe, like, I've always felt connected to them and I feel like they're just the ultimate, you know, um, like role models for me. Like I feel like, and they're not perfect, like I said, but I just love that they lead with love, right? They lead with love and acceptance, unconditional love. Like my mom, unconditional love. And, you know, my dad, my dad's, when we were growing up, my dad was the scary uncle. Like my cousins were afraid of my dad. <laughs> but I'm like, but why? That's my dad. Like, but why? But he comes across with so much, um, you know, like people respect my father. And he earned that in the just the way he lived. And then, but he was also loving as well. So he is loving as well. And so you know, they're just wonderful role models for me. They taught me to be the person I am today and, um, you know, accept me for who I am and allow me to be, you know, who I am, but also guided me along the way. <laughs> Without their guidance, I probably would have been off. All over know. the place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like I need to have coffee with your parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> my dad called me this morning. Um, he called me right before eight o'clock. He's like, I know you're about to start work, but I just want to call you and tell you that I love you so much. Oh my God. And I'm like, Dad. And then he goes, Wait, your mom wants to talk to you real quick. And my mom puts her on speaker. I just want to say we love you. I'm like, Thank you. Love you guys too. Yes. That's that is so beautiful. Do. That's what they do. Well, it's important because one of my friends, he's, you know, since the pandemic, I think I made a lot of people, we go into therapy. Um, we all need it. <laughs> he was never told by his father that his, he loved him and his father passed away when he was a boy. And then his mom only told him he loved him for the first time when he was 43. Wow. Oh my goodness. Oh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. like so it's hard. huge it is. and and not that she didn't love him it was just she did what she was doing as a mom and didn't express it mm -hmm. or maybe didn't know how maybe her parents you know didn't know That's how either I feel like I feel like you know looking back um and you know I talked to my siblings about you know our childhood and growing up we all know and acknowledge that our parents did the best they could yeah mm -hmm. right with what they knew and every parent does the best they could with what they, they know what they had. What and they I had. feel like even, even, you know, your friend and his, his, his mom and dad, I don't know what they went through growing up, but they Correct. probably went through some stuff for them to be that, to be that way, to not have the tools to communicate things like I love you to a child. So you can only imagine through like empathy and compassion, maybe what their childhood was like to not mm -hmm. be able to, to communicate those things. Right. So um, there's always so much compassion. And then those things have an impact on us as, as human beings, as we grow and become adults, but it also takes a lot of courage to go to therapy and to find that healing because there's a lot of healing to, to be done for all of us in every yeah. way, shape or form, no matter where you grew up, there's still healing to be done. 
And so if you and your friend are, um, you know, are in therapy or finding that healing, I think that's a, a courageous thing. I know this yeah. morning when I got off, cause I work nice stuff and my son called me and I'm like, okay, my Corey, he was like, mom, just what's up. He calls me on uh, mom. Dukes. He was like, what's up mom. Dukes? I'm like, Corey, I'm just getting on. He said, well, I'm at work. I just want to say, I love you more. And that just, I had a bad night and he was like, I love you more, but that just did something. Yeah. On that drive, that 45 minute drive from downtown LA to Long Beach. But just him saying, I love you more, Mom Dukes, like, and he was at work. So I was like, oh, my God, yeah. you know, or my daughter or my Bria, she'll call me and be like, just check it on you, Mom, you know, but it just means so much to me. It just makes my day, you yeah. know, so, and I, I think, know. I think, you know, as you receive it, you know, it makes your day. And I feel like we have so many opportunities in a given day to give love and light. Yes. Like when you go, like I had this example where. I would, uh, when I lived in North Hollywood, when I first moved to LA, I, um, I would go to this, this, uh, place to fill up my, my five gallon water bottles, my water jugs. And like, but yes, the guy, <laughs> yeah. the guy that worked there, he was, I think he was, um, Russian and there was a language barrier between him and I, but even though we couldn't speak the same language as my water was filling up, we would try to communicate and we would try to connect. And um, he would pour me, he would get a little styrofoam cup and he would pour me coffee from his coffee thermos that what? his wife packs him in his lunch. I know because we, I figured this out through his conversations. We're trying to communicate. <laughs> um, she packs him like little chocolates and coffee. And so he's there working at the water place. But then when I come in, he would, share his coffee with me oh, and we were there for just less than 10 minutes maybe five minutes as it's as it's filling up but we would try to connect and be each other's light and connection as human beings and I feel like we have opportunities like that every day to to make eye contact with someone and tell them have a great day how, how are you doing today um you know, we don't want to walk through life as zombies because you could brighten someone's day. Oh, right? yeah. Like telling yeah. Them Simple smile. Right? Or just a good morning. Just a good morning. Yes. Like if yes. I walk into a room and it's people, it's like, good morning. Hello. And like some people walk in, they mm -hmm. won't even say anything. I'm like, wow, where were you raised? Where you could walk <laughs> in a room and just walk past people and just not. Like even getting in the acknowledge. Like acknowledge, you know, just a, a grand hello. Good morning, everyone. Even yeah. me getting on the elevator. It's like, hello, good morning. And then you got people in that text like looking at me like, <laughs> I was just saying good morning. So, yeah, connecting on a, I like to say connecting on a human level. Yes. Because I know we're busy, but just taking that moment of saying good morning. How was your day going? That means a lot. It does. And you don't know how it can impact someone for the rest of the day. Yeah, it, it could be. A, I mean. It has a, it has huge. Imp and then if you brighten someone else's day, maybe they carry that on to someone else. And it just starts this right. like, domino, domino effect. effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I believe in that. Just sharing love and light. You just yes. have to, and even a smile, right? Like yes. a smile doesn't cost anything. Just smile. Like, I don't know. There's so many opportunities. I like to take the opportunities to, um, to I share. Do I do that all day long. <laughs> good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. I try to say hi and talk to people as much as possible. Like just to, you know, yeah. spread the, spread the love <laughs> and the light. And sometimes I get into like my think mode, right? Like I'm in this thinking mode and like, I could just be like, focus and then someone snaps me out of it by like saying good morning or like hi how are you doing and I'm like oh oh hey how you doing <laughs> it's it's one of those things where I could see myself getting into the um focus mode and and you have to give yourself some grace to also snap out of that and, and be and connect with people when you have an opportunity yeah yeah, yeah. get off our phones <laughs> oh, oh that's a big that's a big one because yeah. they're so in touch with especially the iPhone users. Yes. Like y'all cannot get off these iPhones. <laughs> I have a, a thing when I'm around 
like if I make a plan with a friend um, or just, you know, out to dinner with someone, I feel like, well, I don't feel like I, what I do is I put my phone away and I just yep. don't, I put it on silent, silent. You, and present. you just have to, you have, you have to be present in the moment. Yeah. You, you lose so much of your life going through the day with your head down on your device, you know, I mean, we're all guilty. I'm guilty of it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all are. <laughs> you need to be conscious about that and be intentional with who we connect with when we do make plans. Like you have to be present. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, before we get leave, I do want to talk about a couple things. So with your sitcom King of Downey, yes. I got to know what was it like working with Jerry Garcia? Oh yeah. Oh God. He's so fun. He's so funny. <laughs> I can <laughs> imagine. He's a great comedian. Um, Jerry Garcia is so funny. He's a great comedian. I work. There was multiple comedians on the show. There was um, Jerry Garcia, Concrete, uh, another comedian, Jay Valentino, great comedian, Tanya Estrada, another great oh. comedian, a female comedian. Those were all the comedians that were on the show. And then um, Marco Bada played oh he's a great actor he's on that um and, and your partner didn't die in this yeah he didn't die, <laughs> he didn't die. <laughs> he's still alive we're still married yeah there's uh seven more episodes for us to film but it's a, a family oh. sitcom it's a comedy he was great you know what I, I i learned a lot from working with comedians on set um a lot even if there's a script and i i come with my homework done so i i know my lines and i'm ready to go but when you work with comedians, be ready for them to like switch it up on you. They're like, oh, no, no, that joke doesn't land. We're going to move it. We're going to change this. I'm like, wait a minute. I memorized my lines. Like, I know what's happening in the scene. And you just like rewrote the whole scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's nerve wracking. Like, on the fly. Like comedians are able to do that. They're like, and then they'll just discuss it real quick. I'm like, okay, this worked. We'll just say this instead. And so the like, circumstances change. I'm like, uh, wait, you got to give me a moment to memorize this. Like. <laughs> But they're just so natural with the human, um, like they're, they're masters at the human condition. They're masters at human behavior. And that's why they're so good at being comedians Yeah, because they smart. observe and um, they just can emulate that human behavior um, so naturally. And so working with comedians was, was uh, where Jerry Garcia was amazing. He taught me a lot. Tanya taught me a lot. Tanya actually spent time with me. Um, on one of the scenes, we were talking about the comedic timing of it and um, having one of the jokes land. And so, you know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from every set, but this one was particularly fun. Mm. It was really fun. So you working. find yourself laughing. They had to say cut because everybody's <laughs> laughing, especially when I'm on certain sets. And they're like, all right, you know, cut. <laughs> and then they're like, take 26. <laughs> yeah, no, that's because of you, Renee, <laughs> that we're on take 26 laughing. <laughs> yes. Well, with this one, I think everybody was pretty good. We didn't have to redo any takes because we were laughing. It's It was really after, after like, after the scene and then everybody busts up laughing because oh, good. oh my god that was so funny <laughs> okay okay well good <laughs> yeah. you internet <laughs> yeah you can, we're we're trouble together on oh that. my god <laughs> yeah so don't they, they have to separate us oh yeah they probably will put me off of a comedy show they'd be like you know what this is really hard um i rem well i learned i had to get better at this as an actor when I was uh, early on in my acting career, I remember doing a student film and the scene I, I in the scene, I found out that my husband's best friend was just killed. And so we're crying. We're in the hospital. We're getting the news from the doctor that he just died. And, and you're supposed to start. Crying. My character's supposed to start crying. But right before we were shooting the scene, the whole cast, crew, director, everybody, they were joking around about something and we were all laughing out loud. Oh, no. And so. Okay, so then we're all laughing and joking, and then they're like, "Okay, action!" And then they're like, "You're supposed to cry." I'm like, "Yeah, but we were just laughing right now. Like, you just got to give me a moment, right?" And so I had to transition into the the mood. But I realized that the circumstances aren't always going to be ideal, right? Like, a learning from other productions where, okay, in these circumstances, I may need space to be alone and to um, kind of get into 
mm-hmm. character and get into, um, you know, where I've been before the scene starts. But I need to also vocalize to who I'm working with, like I need this space or I, you know, I, I need to do this to get there. And then, so there's two sides to that. So vocalize what you need, but also be ready to adapt. So now I'm able to, through experience and practice, people can be laughing around me on set and joking. And then we get into this, um, this scene, I can snap into it. Um, I couldn't do that before. And so, um, you know, change your moods. Like they're all laughing on set and then switch over. And now we're doing a dramatic, scary, sad scene. I could do that now, but before I couldn't. And so, you know, laughing on set is one thing, but also being able to get into character with the circumstances around you and continue to do your job as an actor is is also a challenge, but you get better at it, right? I think. Yeah, some, oh, I, yeah. Heard, I work with some actors and actresses that they are like, you know, I need to be by myself in my trailer because I need to be in that character. So they're they not. It's like, I'll talk to you all later. But right now I need to be in that character. I need to be in that mode. So I'm going to go off here. And then mm-hmm. when everything is finished and it's like a totally different person. So I get it. Mm-hmm. So well, actors, with an actor, it's also getting to a point where you allow yourself to speak up for yourself yes to yes. ask for those moments you know like give me five because <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's nerve-wracking you think that you you had to have known that already or you're just supposed to snap it on like you said but that takes time yeah and to take the time to speak up for yourself like rest <laughs> yes like resting like saying okay yeah no I gotta I gotta cancel I need some sleep <laughs> yeah. yep. not no guilty <laughs> yes exactly and, and not feel guilty for saying no right you got to be able to say no I'm learning learning how to do that more oh, well. I say no more now and yeah. I like it no <laughs> <laughs> that's good yep. <laughs> like, I didn't need to ask anything but it's no yeah. I just anything, get it's no no, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on our podcast and being our oh leading lady yes. this week. Um, is there anything you want to plug? Any new movies coming out that we can catch you in or other podcasts that we can see you? Oh, gosh, I've been I've been I've been doing a lot of podcasts this year. I'm really okay. excited. Well, awesome. I'm, I'm doing a lot of podcasts. I've I've done JR and the crew in Los Angeles, um, The Voice of L.A., um, just recently, I'm also on Tony's Rhodium Radio. Um, I did a dining with the wizard with him as well as a an interview. Um, I'm also on the Pocho Live podcast as well. Um, and then Chicano Hollywood's uh, King of Downey. We're working on the um, other seven episodes that we're going to film. We did the sizzle. And so now we're preparing to do to film the other episodes. Um, you'll be able to see that on the Chicano Hollywood streaming platform when it becomes available. Mm-hmm. And then um, let's see. And then I'm also writing my, my three episode anthology, which I'll hope, hopefully have filmed by the end of this year. Uh, so we'll be doing that. Well, if you want yeah. someone to read the script, <laughs> send yes. it my way. Yes. Yeah. yes. I'll send that over so you can, you can check it out when it's, when it's ready. And then yeah. um, what else am I working? Oh, I just filmed this week, uh, the stationary bike. With it's a short story based on a Stephen King short story. They uh, adapted it into a short film. Wow. Um, and let's see, uh, Doctor West Ferber. That's releasing this year. It's in the film festival circuit as well. In broad daylight, it's in the film festival circuit. Um, Wish you were here is also another film um, that I did. Uh, it should be releasing this year. And um, Gosh, it's it's so it's such an exciting time. I feel yeah, you've yeah, got so a much. lot of stuff brewing. Yeah. Yes, um, and I'm feeling really blessed and grateful. And thank you for having me on your yes, podcast. Thank absolutely. you for recognizing yes. uh, my work and asking me to be a part of your Leading Ladies podcast. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed talking with you both today. Oh, and we're sharing with you both today yes. as well and hearing about your story too. Yes. Yeah, well, there's more we need to dive into. But yes. where can people find you to follow you on social and your new releases of all your films and yeah. sitcoms? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram under Sonia Balcazar and it's S-O-N-I-A 
Um, and then I'll spell my last name because it's difficult. <laughs> B-A-L-C-A-Z-A-R. Um, I'm also on Facebook and on Twitter. I'm not as active on Twitter, but I've, I've had an account for quite some time. <laughs> and, um, let's see, Facebook and uh, Twitter and Instagram. I'm most active on Instagram. Um, I'm also on IMDb. So please check out my IMDb um, with the work that I've done there as well. Um, yeah, that's where you can find me. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So go check out Sonia Balcazar and thank Balcazar. you for tuning into this week's episode. Thank you for sharing your experience with us with today, Sonia. For yes, more of our Sonia. content, you can follow us on our social media at heat underscore ent. That's H E E P underscore E N T. And if you have feedback, guest selections, collab pitches, or anything you want to tell us, you can reach out to our team at heapent at gmail.com. And until next time, continue la- leading. Continue <laughs> lead, ladies. <laughs> well, thank you, Sonia. I'm going to stop. Yes. <laughs>